Thanks for uh, the invite. Uh, it's an important topic, you know, what comes next after Trump. Uh, though I, I, I have to say, I'm not quite sure uh, that we're quite through with Trump, you know. Um, uh, a lot depends, comrades, on what happens in just a couple of weeks in the state of Georgia. Where on January the 5th, the, uh, there will be an election for two Senate seats, two that will determine the balance of power uh, in both the United States Congress and uh, potentially uh, in the country. There is good news though. Um, on Monday, the first uh, installment of shipments of the coronavirus vaccine was shipped out all across the country. And also on Monday, um, the Electoral College in the United States confirmed the decision of the American people on November the 3rd to defeat Donald Trump. Both issues uh, uh, gave us hope. Uh, you're probably aware, uh, folks, that uh, the United States reached a terrible uh, threshold with uh, 300,000 300, COVID deaths. Um, you might not be aware, uh, though, that um, also on Monday, with respect to the political health of the country, that the vote for the Electoral College, because of credible threats of violence, were held in some cases in secret and in other cases under armed guard. It's true, I'm not making this up. It is difficult to overstate the challenge that we are facing. The president of these United States has uh, attempted, is attempting to overturn the election. And he was backed uh, by a uh, majority of uh, Republicans in the United States Congress uh, and backed by a mass movement uh, that is uh, well-financed and uh, well-organized and armed. Armed, and I'm not talking about the US military, armed. Um, and, and you have a situation uh, where 80% of the Republican Party believes that the election was stolen by uh, Detroit, by uh, Laura Philadelphia, uh, by Atlanta, by Tucson, by Phoenix. In other words, by uh, criminal, corrupt African-Americans and Latinos. That is the charge that they were making, you see. There hasn't been a time since um, Reconstruction after the Civil War when, when such uh, very outrageous charges were made, and I was reminded last night as I was thinking about how to prepare for this presentation that, that, uh, that the, the people who were making those charges were called populists back then. And, and this marked the rise of the uh, imperial uh, wizards of the Ku Klux Klan and, and the rise of the Democratic Party at that particular moment in time. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of issues in this election. Uh, they had to do with the place of US imperialism in the world economy. Uh, uh, international trade, immigration, uh, 
I know you comrades are familiar with that. You're going through the, the, the Brexit. And by the way, we are in solidarity with you and your attempts to uh, create conditions for left uh, exit. Um, there were there were the relationship of the United States to China to Russia uh, to um, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, the situation in the southern in the southern he hemisphere, and then of course uh, there was the uh, uh, economic uh, anxiety among sections of the working class. Uh, and 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 lower middle class uh, and and all of that, uh, but uh, in my opinion, at 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 bottom, what what motivated the uh, majority of the Republican base was fear, uh, white fear, fear among sections of the white population that the evolution of the United States in the direction of a multiracial uh, and multinational country and state was going to mean that they were going to lose their place in the sun. You, see? you know, <laughs> in a certain sense, this is nothing new. I'll tell you our little story. 12 years ago, we were uh, working uh, to elect the first African-American president of this country. We thought at that time that it was a good thing to do. And in fact, we still think it was a good thing to do. And I was working in my hometown. I, I come from a, a steel producing, a former steel producing center in Northeastern Ohio, Youngstown. My town produced the, uh, largest amount of steel in the world during the Second World War. Now it's a ghost town. And we were working out in the suburbs, you know, predominantly white and and uh, we were phone banking. And I remember that there was a, a guy uh, uh, there, elderly guy, I can, I can see him today. Glasses, bald headed, little pot belly, a little bit like me, you know. Uh, and uh, he was doing the phone banking and all of a sudden he stopped and he said, oh my goodness, guys, sisters, you, you won't believe the call I just had. We said, what happened? He said, I was reading the script. <laughs> he said, I was reading the script and, 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 and as I was doing that, the guy interrupted me. And he said, man, he said, what do you want? Do you want uh, a white house, or do you want a black house? <laughs> and the guy said, I didn't know what to say. So he said, well, what did you say? He said, I told him, what do you want? You want a black house, or do you want to be in the poor house? <laughs> and it was a good answer. But comrades, the irony of the situation is that over the eight years of the Obama administration and the four year chance of Mr. Trump, the people of our community of that section of the country um, remained largely in the poorhouse. To make the point, I'll tell you another little story. Fast forward, uh, 12 years, we decided before the election that we were going to hold a, a, uh, uh, a Zoom event in my hometown, you know? And so we gathered together the comrades and family people, neighbors and, and others. And I, I tried to convince one member of my family to participate. And before I could get really started, he said, he said, Uncle Joe, he said, I'm not trying to go to no meeting about the election. I said, but, but, he said, but nothing. He said, I, um, uh, I'm tired of it. He said, Obama didn't do nothing for me and my family. 
And Trump hasn't done anything for me and my family either. And I'm just, I'm just not having it. And don't you know that on election day, when uh, the votes were counted, Donald Trump won my county, my hometown, first time a Republican has won since 1972, you see? So yes, it is, it is difficult to uh, change people's minds without changing their economic circumstances and giving them something to live and vote and struggle for. And, and in my opinion, this is the biggest challenge that is facing the incoming administration. You know, will they be able to um, implement the uh, program, the platform that was adopted at their convention a few months ago? Um, will they be able to, 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 to build a movement that will compel its implementation? You know, one of the uh, things that is said about the Obama years is that, uh, the, the movement which brought him, and it was a mass movement into office after the election went home. And that therefore there was uh, uh, not the push from below to implement that program. I'm not sure that was true. As I recall, they attempted to maintain an independent uh, structure. Um, and even if they didn't, remember just after the election, Occupy Wall Street uh, shook the country, shook the world, really. The, the debate was changed from neoliberal austerity. Uh, the, the conversation shifted uh, from the relationship between the 1% and the 99%. Remember that? And then there was the emergence of the Tea Party. And so it wasn't so much that there weren't movements, uh, but, that, but that the movements uh, uh, on the left or from the center for democracy weren't strong enough to compel change. And so, and so the big question today is, is are we able to, to build a movement from below by the way, we, we have a tremendous uh, impetus and base to build on over the last several months with, with Black Lives Matter uh, and, and, and then the, the mass electoral uprising that took place uh, uh, just before the uh, election, which resulted in 80 million votes uh, against Trump and, and for uh, democracy. And so the, the main question for us is um, focusing on the struggles that will help build such a movement. You know, I, I saw the article, my article in the Morning Star and please Mary and John, thank the comrades for uh, publishing it. And then I saw a tweet, they tweeted it this morning and the tweet said, Joe is coming to London. And, and, and Joe is going to talk about the party support for the Popular Front. And, and Joe is going to talk about the party's uh, support for defending the vote that defeated those fascists. And it said then that Joe is going to talk about the party's uh, support for the victory, victorious Democratic Party. Those were the three. And so I said to myself, well, that's wonderful. They, they, they got two of the three right. Yes, we support the Popular Front. So it's changing. Yes, we support defending the vote of our people against Trump. And yes, we uh, support uh, the efforts of the uh, elected Congress 
and those to the executive branch to the degree that they fight to implement the program that was put forward. And so uh, there, is, there is unity um, and there is also struggle, but it will not be a blanket support for the Democratic Party, but a support based on the issues, based on the issues. And what are the issues? The issues are jobs, the issues are healthcare, the issue is, is getting them children out of cages and having a humane immigration policy. The issue uh, is ending police violence. The issue is ending U.S. intervention in Cuba and Venezuela. You know, the issue is a two-state solution in the Middle East, uh, redefining U.S. foreign policy. And to the extent that we are able to do that, and to build a movement for below and to fight in the course of this broad front for working class leadership of that front, to that degree, we will be successful. And so we say that the issue is struggle, struggle, struggle some more, claim no easy victories as we struggle, be honest with the people, help build our party and help build our, our movement.